Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The goal of Voices is to highlight the experiences of leaders confronting major public health frontiers and to better understand effective leadership and how it can affect change. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon and welcome to our audience here in the studio and to our viewers online around the globe. I'm Eric Anderson, the Director of Voices and Leadership. This series focuses on the lessons of effective leadership to create positive change in public health. This event takes place in the Leadership Studio where the programs and related content have received over 4 million views to date and counting. Today we host a discussion on finding solutions to complex problems with Professor Robert Blendon and Representative Jeffrey Sanchez. Mr. Sanchez represented Mission Hill, Jamaica Plain, and Brookline in the Massachusetts House of Representatives for 16 years, and was lauded as a leader in health care reform, housing and infrastructure, gun laws and violence prevention, criminal justice reform, and the environment. Mr. Sanchez was chairman of the House Committee on Ways and Means. He also served as chairman of the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing and chairman of the Joint Committee on Public Health, as well as vice chair of the Joint Committee on Economic Development. In all his endeavors, Mr. Sanchez has stood up for those most vulnerable. He fought and defeated efforts to repeal gay marriage. He championed comprehensive criminal justice reform. He is a successful advocate for English language learners. Before running for state representative in 2002, Mr. Sanchez worked for Boston Mayor Tom Menino for four years. We're fortunate that this spring, Mr. Sanchez is serving as a Mentor Senior Leadership Fellow here at the Chan School. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, Professor Robert Blendon, please join me as we welcome Jeffrey Sanchez to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Uh, hi, if this was a television program, I would start out with just simply saying, this is personal. Uh, so, uh, Jeff, while a member of the legislature, was a student in my class. Uh, I, I developed an unbelievable affection for him and incredible personality. And the, watched as he did incredible things. So what he and I agreed, that we were going to take uh, the first section to talk about things he did. And because I teach politics, it's very important for people to realize you can be in public life and really do important things. We're in a world of such cynicism. And Jeff got things done that re really matter to people. Uh, uh, part two is he grew up around this community, uh, but not in this community. Uh, so we're going to have a discussion about how that shaped his public view and role, and also uh, uh, why it really matters if people in the legislature are, are, are come from different backgrounds. Uh, uh, so part one is Jeff just going through some of the things he did. I admired you then, and we're back again. Well, well Bob, <laughs> you know, the, this school has been an incredible part of my life, my entire life, yeah. and uh, and I, it's been my pleasure and honor to, to, to not only sat in your class, but um, I've been I haven't let you go since I met you, as well as Nancy <laughs> Trumbull, as well as uh, everybody else, and Dean Williams ever yeah. since, and, and I feel very grateful. Uh, to the school for this opportunity and the time that we're spending together. And, you know, it's, it's a, essentially a, a great time because it's offered me an opportunity to talk about, okay, how did we get our universal ca coverage yeah. program that ensures 98% of the population set? What, what were the discussions? Not only that, what, did we, that, what were the principles that we attached ourselves to? And it was the, the, the principle of shared responsibility. And as a result, we were able to do so much. We, we, we made sure that, that, that health care for children was protected, health care for the working poor protected. We made sure that we, we, uh, we provided co-pay free birth, uh, birth control. We wrote legislation that, that mandated prescribing limits. We did things, that, we did things in, in health care that people thought that we're, we weren't going to be able to do given the size of the program itself. At the same time, you know, when you're in a when when the, when Speaker DeLeo pointed me to, to to Ways and Means, he said, "There's going to be so much that comes at you, and sometimes there are things that you might want to spend more time on, things that 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 you might feel 
challenged by. And for me, it was the criminal justice reform bill that, that we wrote. I never really spent time on the criminal justice issues really in depth because I think of everything that I saw and, and what I and other Puerto Rican and black men in this community went through during the during the 70s and the 80s it, it felt weird but imagine I got to be the, the, the I got to sit in in the office to craft the the, the criminal justice bill that dealt with issues of mandatory minimum sentences, that dealt with the issues of expungement on, on particular laws, that got into bail reform, wholesale court uh, reform as well, and at the same time dealt with challenges that we were having with the, with the state police. And it, it was incredible to be in the room with Justice Roderick Ireland, a, a distinguished member of the, of, of the, court, the, of the, of the Supreme Court, uh, retired, uh, the speaker himself and others, and be able to talk about what I saw and what I continue to see while I was in office and write a sweeping criminal justice bill that has been lauded by so many that, that deals with people where they're and where they're at in their lives and the system to make to make changes within the system to not to look at them as individuals and not a wholesale policy and at the same time we took up the issue in this in the, in the discussion relative to gun uh, reform imagine we were the first state to ban bump stocks not only that, we're one of the only states to, that establish an extreme risk protection order mandate, which essentially says that if you feel uncomfortable and you think that someone who has a, 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 a who is licensed to carry may pose a challenge to themselves and problems to the community, you will be able to go to the police department or to, or to the court to have that removed. The, those are things that the, that the conversations, yeah, yeah. and it happened with, it happened with the lobby. It happened with individuals. It doesn't. None of the change doesn't happen in a vacuum, and uh, and so and, and at the same time we got to write a 42 billion dollar budget that made unprecedented investments in education, mental health, homelessness, all the things that I saw, that uh, that I saw growing up as a kid. I got to spend time on to make that to make that difference, and I always tried to make sure that again that there were things that were close to me, and you know for in. You know, when, when we were talking about here in Massachusetts, the pressure of, of housing, it's health, housing, it's all these other things, but the housing piece is such a big deal. And to be able to be the, the one to shepherd through a $2 billion housing bond bill, another $2 billion environmental bill, uh, bond bill that's going to provide, that's going to provide to deal with the environmental issues and challenges that we have while at the same time making sure that there are resources so that people, so that organizations like community development corporations can build affordable housing because the pressure is so so much on them and I got to and at all of this I also got to redevelop the housing projects that I grew up in <laughs> that were falling apart yeah. that my mother was a part of the group of women who felt that, you know during the 70s that they were felt ignored and they organized and they saved that housing project the Latina and the African American and the Irish women the, the Italian women that live in that community banded together and said no this property and these, these this housing belongs to the people and and I saw those examples and it made that it, I was fortunate because I was able to carry so much of that out in the short time that I was there well 16 years but it <laughs> went by fast <laughs> So, how did you get some of that done? Um, I think that there's two things. It's environment and it's people. Yeah. So, just think, in 2003, when I came in, the, the world was so charged with, with what was happening relative to the conversations that we had in a gubernatorial election relative to same-sex couples. And what, are, what, is a, what, is a, what, are, what is a right? And how, what are human rights? And um, to be a, a part of the original 10 people that were part of making sure that this, the Defense of Marriage Act initiatives that were happening nationally and that the former governor was trying to pressure us into taking up in a constitutional convention that we were actually able to defeat. And it was, a, it was, it was really something else. I remember the court officers telling us that, I remember the court officers telling us that it, they had never seen that many people outside of the building since the civil rights yeah. era, mm -hmm. since the time that when Martin Luther King came to the to the state house um, to to uh, deliver as I had a, to have a dream speech on the floor of the House of Representatives, and ultimately what I noticed was it's groups of people, catalysts of people, and and you know you know be it gay marriage or be it universal coverage, there was a shared principle. Everybody has shared responsibility to keep this thing going. Business, individuals, 
government, and government from the state to the federal and even local communities as well. And that's how we've kept it together. And, it bo and that the, sa in the same premise happened with the criminal justice legislation. It went all over on, in so many different things. When, there, when we started, there might have been eight provisions. The, the, we ended up with 15 to 17. And it was because you had all these different interests and different people that came to it. And they were such complex pieces that you tried to, you tried to, you tried to understand who were the constituents and who were the people that were most effective. And at the same time, try and figure out where can you land at so that you can end up with the biggest, most, uh, over, most um, expansive reach so that you can do wholesale reform, but at the same time so that you're not focusing on the individual. I'm sorry, you're not focusing on people as a, you know, like the war on drugs or the, the you know, I mean, to figure, you know, what are the monikers, right? We wanted to focus on in, how, did, how do we make sure that people are recognized as people and individuals, and it carried, it carried. And what I try and what I try and do everything is meet people where they're at, um, whether it's you know a mother with their child, whether it's uh, the executive director, the advocacy groups, the state reps, the the membership. You mentioned how you went around and met. You have to not yeah. only you have to not only listen. You, remember, in the in the House, there's 160 members, and there's in the Senate, there's 40 members. When you're in a position of leadership, the way that I was in, in Ways and Means, you are constantly counting. You're counting to see how, much, how many people are interested in your issue or interested in certain things. And in some in some of these things that have so many provisions, you're, you're trying to keep fresh with them so that you understand. And sometimes that takes you out. It's not only sitting down with all 160 of them in the office, it's going out to Springfield and going to the Brightwood Community Health Center and listening to what, the, what, what are the patients suffering from, given that there's still people that are picking tobacco or whatever it may be out in the, out in the western part of the state, or going out to Pittsfield and, and seeing how a change in economy have left this beautiful community trying to struggle with their identity when they don't have broadband, you know, broadband um, in this new economy, but at the same time, they have this incredible thing called MoMA that has that has revived uh, that has revived the, the a community out in North Adams and beyond, and then also down in the western part, down in the coastal state on the on the coast as well, going to see the the the, uh, the oyster farmers and and the cranberry bogs, and you follow people where they're at, because at that point you have a better sense of understanding who they are and why they're so committed to one or two things. And in that, I, was, I feel like I was able to bring pieces together on the reps, but also the interests themselves. You know, so it might be the farmer group or the community health center group or the hospital group. Everybody has different interests and you're trying to figure out how do you cobble things together. And, the, and I think the success that I've had is, is in that, is trying to figure out what do people really value? And ultimately, how does it help the most vulnerable amongst us in such a state that has such incredible wealth? And I think that Massachusetts, we've, we've committed ourselves to that. Remember, Massachusetts, 43% of the state's budget is focused on health care. It is a noble cause. We are noble, this is a, an incredible commonwealth in that 43% of the state's budget. Our Medicaid program covers one a quarters, uh, co covers a quarter of the population. It is a big program. Yeah. It is a complicated program, and it's for me. It's an econ it's an it's an economic engine, and I, I, you know, given my my new life now, my concern is with all the noise that's happening between Washington and locally, and the costs, and how do you keep it together? How do we make sure that we keep this? Because Massachusetts was a model throughout that time. But in this new environment, there are other states that are getting more attention than Massachusetts because they're going a different route than what we did. <coughs> and then on the other side, there's other ideas that are diametrically different than what anybody, you know, what, what again, what's, what's, what, what, what other states are doing on this side, on this coast to the, to the right coast uh, or, or the left coast, depending on how How did you make it work with governors? I'd, I've always had a... I've always had a really good relationship yeah. with, with, with the governors that, I, that, that I've served with. Um, and most recently, working with, with, uh, with Governor Baker, as a progressive liberal, I wanted, to, I wanted not to like him. 
<laughs> I wanted not to like him. It would have been easy, you know, to vilify him. And, but let me tell you something. I was so impressed at how he's handled himself with people in groups. And yes, we don't agree on a bunch of different things. But the way that I've seen, you know, when I saw the budget come out and I saw some of the ideas that he tossed when I was in Ways and Means and I didn't see it there, I'm like, yeah, sure, you made me go through this and now you didn't, <laughs> now, right now I'm gone, right? You know, but he's, you know, is again, the values. You're trying to see that, you, you know, I don't care what's attached to your name, ultimately, where are your values? And I know that with him, we share certain values. And I saw it when he first, I saw it when he first ran, but the second time that I saw, when, the second time that he ran, I, I saw it even more so because I saw the amount of time that he was spending in a part of, the, of my community that frankly, he didn't really have to do. It wasn't a vote rich community. It wasn't all these different things that you'd think that right. he would have to do. Yeah. And he did it, and that, and that stuck out with me. And as a result, again, everything that I mentioned that we did in an 18-month period, I mean, it's, it's incredible what we've done. And, but again, we're going into a new session right now. Yeah, the, 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 we're, our unemployment rate is super high. Our unemployment rate super is, low. I'm sorry, super low. Um, and, you know, jobs are out there, but, you know, the, the equity is always going to be an issue you know, the wage gap that exists. And we've had conversations, you know, when we worked on the, on the paid family leave law and minimum wage law that, 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 we, that we, you know, that we passed last session, um, it was a pretty big conversation that we had on, on wage equity and equity as a whole. Um, and that's something that we're gonna have to continue because now there are folks that wanna try again to go at this quote unquote millionaire's tax. Um, and how do, you, how, how do you go at it? How do you have the conversations now, um, given that, I don't know, the, 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 uh, the numbers for revenues this past, uh, that just came in, were a few hundred million down. We're not, folks are saying we're not, you know, we're not completely worried about it, but for somebody, for somebody that was in that role and you have to make sure that you're, fis that you're fiscally prudent and responsible, um, of the tax, you know, of, of the citizens' money, and also how the world views the Commonwealth, um, things like that, you know, kind of, you know, kind of gets you thinking. Okay, is there something to come, or is it just a little bump in the road? And again, who is around the table to, that I should, uh, that we should be talking to, so that we get, so that we understand um, how do we prepare ourselves for something? All right, I promised the audience. Now you were going to tell us how you became you. <laughs> um, Nothing. I grew up across the street. Yeah, well, there's more, more, <laughs> more, more, more there. Yeah, yeah. Now's not the time to be humble. No, I mean, it's nothing. It was the, you know, the early '70s. The, the reason why we came here was because of this community. It was because of Children's Hospital. We came from Washington Heights. My parents, you know, my father, my father was a dock manager at a, at a textile, a textile uh, distributorship in downtown, in, you know, in, around Lincoln Center, and uh, and my mother. And my mother, um, my mother sewed buttons and on shirts, and she's a girl who grew up on a tobacco farm in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. you, you see the similar, the, the, so my, my sister, we, we came out here because my sister was sick, and my, and my, um, my mother's uh, intuition kicked in. You know, a Presbyterian had an idea on how my sister should be treated, and my mother, felt that they, there should be another way, and she came here. Um, and it was during a time when the housing project, about half of the, the housing units were empty over in Mission, Maine, yeah. and HUD and the city essentially wanted a mothball it. And my mother, you know, we ended up there with my aunt who used to, who used to work at New Balance, and she find, uh, she, she find, let's just say my mother, you don't say no to her. She figures out a way, <laughs> because during that time, there's a hospital um, that wasn't taking kids in the emergency room. They weren't taking people in the emergency rooms. They were only, they were doing everything through outpatient visit at yeah. the time. And you know, being Puerto Rican, being Hispanic, and and being black from the South, even though we lived across the street, a lot of the folks we grew up with were receiving health care over at City Hospital. Yeah. And it was a ch it was you know so. So she struggled, but she got the she got it, and then she became an activist and did a whole bunch of things, and 
you know, and, and she raised her little boy and her daughter and, and um, it, it, was, it was a great, it was a, it was a great road because I always had an example in my house um, and somebody who was really strong to keep you in, but that train, that train track, that was a real boundary. That was a real boundary. You know, there were times that we couldn't cross that boundary to come here. You know, my, my first, my first uh, experiences with the institution, let's just say weren't very good at 10 and 11 years old. You know, we used to want to go play in that quad where the grass was really green <laughs> because the park was, the parks were all messed up yeah. over here in Mission, Maine between the garbage and the, again, we were living in, in a place that wanted, you know, folks wanted to shut down. So let's just say the grass over here was really greener. Um, but let's just say the Harvard, you know, the Harvard police didn't, didn't particularly like that. <laughs> you know, kids, you know, jumping around with, you know, playing football and acting the fool on the, on the quad. But, and my mother, that was, the, my mother would engage during that time because the history of these institutions with this community has been, has been tenuous for, a, was tenuous for a long time when, when uh, expansion ideas were happening in the 60s. Those large buildings that are there, it was all urban renewal. These, all these properties that were here were triple deckers and they were brownstones mm -hmm. where, the, where the big buildings are. And urban renewal also allowed for, for the institutions to, to, to buy property in the neighborhood as well. And the plans, some of these plans didn't materialize and they ended up tearing down homes affecting the health of the community, and it was easy because we were all black and Puerto Rican and poor, and white poor as well. Um, so, but what, it, but what I saw throughout this community throughout that entire time was an activism that was pure. If it was the parks over in Mission Park that negotiated, they, that negotiated that the Brigham could expand, but they had to offer development for affordable housing on the other side, or my mother taking on the city and, uh, and, and others and to make sure that that property stayed affordable as well. Also the women from the, that were affiliated with the church making sure that they went after some of the others after they tore down the properties yeah. in the back of the hill. The level of activism that, were here, that was here was incredible and as I look now, as I look now, um, it was real leadership and it came from the women in this community. It came from the women in this community. You know, there was, yeah, there were some men that were, that were around, but they were moms, they were daughters, they were working. I mean, there was a lot going on um, and they did so much and they did so much and they, if it weren't for them, we would have lost what is the fabric of, of, of this community, you know, and it's the relationship with the institutions have improved dramatically but the pressures are still there. So how did you get just from that moment into politics? Um, I didn't want to get into politics. I wanted to be an investment banker. I got my securities license. I was living on the border. I did, you know. We're very pleased I, it didn't work out I, that I, way. <laughs> and I appreciate you saying that. But I, I, you know, I lived on the border. I had an opportunity to come yeah, back. Yeah. Um, and then somebody introduced me to this guy to, you know, to to the Italian, you know, mayor, Tom, and I thought it was the funniest thing because, you know, growing up as a kid, I always thought, you know, I always thought government jobs went to the Irish guys, you know, me being the Puerto Rican guy from the projects, right? <laughs> so, um, so, you know, so me with, so, I don't know, if you had to know Menino, you know, it's like, you know, I, I don't know, I end up with him somehow and I'm thinking, okay, it's because he needs help because he got, when, when Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton loved Tom Menino, and Bill Clinton gave, the, the, they, he gave redevelopment money through the program called Hope Six. And the first ones that he gave was to, to here in Boston and then Cabrini, Mission Maine and Orchard Park, and then Cabrini Green in Chicago. And they were technically, like they were the poster child of messed up housing projects. <laughs> so Clinton was on it. So, um, so Menino at the time, like the discussions that we're having now about equity and race and ethnicity, Menino was going through all this as well. He had gotten, you know, the, we had an ugly stain in the neighborhood relative to the murder of Carol DeMady mm -hmm. uh, here in the neighborhood. The, the city got flipped over. It was the reason why I left because, again, it was that ugly during that time. And um, sitting down with Menino, he had this vision that 
he, he wanted everybody in the housing project to have a front and a backyard. I mean, it was as simple as that. And he engaged people, he tried to engage people on it, but people were skeptical about the change. And our, and our community leaders were skeptical about it. And, you know, he, this, you know, sometimes Benito could be a little abrasive, you know? So, so somehow I end up with him and, uh, and he tells me, and, uh, you know, I think I'm going to go work for one of the mutual fund companies. And then he says, don't, he's like, he's like, you could join, he's like, you could do that anytime. He said, we could get this thing done. He said, didn't you grow up over there? <laughs> And then, uh, and then it was just the, I'm like, and then it's like, you know, days of our life and you're like, <laughs> it goes through your head and you know, you're like, and, and then all of a sudden I, I'm chasing ambulances, going into burning buildings. I'm like, you know, because with Menino, you had to be on all the time. So you get the phone call, you know, the, my first thing was a flood in Rosendale and he's, you know, he's got all of us like going to Home Depot to get rafts to get people out. and. Ultimately, it was all about the people, and it was all about the frail. How do you make sure that you don't forget people? And that's what I tried to do in my entire career. You know, so it was that, and then my predecessor, my predecessor decided he was going to move out, and I, and uh, and nothing, and I decided to run, and it's been a great 16 years, and and uh, it's been a great 16 years, you know, and it, it happened very quickly. It happened very quickly, and uh, and now I got a chance to breathe with all of you. <laughs> so I have a little sign. It's not over yet. <laughs> uh, before we end, uh, uh, at least the fir first round, if uh, you were advising uh, the next you at a younger age, what would you tell them strategically to think about in, in trying to move ahead, doing what you did? I think it. I mean, it's kitschy, but follow. You, you got to follow your heart, you know. And at the end of the day, there's going to be a crossroads where it's okay. Do I do? You know, why am I doing this? You know, <coughs> if I do this or if I do that. But I think you got to just follow your heart. And frankly, that's what I did my entire my entire time. You know, follow my heart and listen to the days of our life story in my head when when Menino was in front of me, all the way to when I ran, and then you know to when to when Bob DeLeo put me in public health. I mean, my experience in healthcare at that time was all the time that I spent in, with the expansion projects of the Longwood Medical Area. I, I was on every single master planning process for all of the hospitals, all of these colleges throughout that entire time. And that was my, ex that was my experience. I knew the people and I think that the speaker, the speaker knew that I knew the people. And ultimately, it's that, you know. So, ultimately, it's that. With that, uh, it has been a privilege, not only the session, but know, knowing Jeff and what he's about. Uh, and for a next generation, this is a model about why we do the things we do. It just, from the first moment I met him, this was somebody that was really going to make change. Oh, thank Jeff, you, thank you again. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.